Okay. Sorry, committee. Um, I did take a little, uh, thought I had a longer break than apparently I had. And I did something. I drove up to Compass School here in Westminster and um, delivered the letters for the seniors. The Wyndham County delegation has sent a letter to every graduating senior um, in Wyndham County, telling them how sorry we were that they couldn't have their real graduations and how Becca wrote a beautiful letter. So that was a great, that was a great thing for you guys to do. It was a lot more complicated than we thought. And Mike Barron earned his angel wings doing this, I'll tell you. He, um, he helped us every step of the way. So anyway, so what we thought we would do today is um, kind of start with, we're focusing today on, um, well, for those of you who weren't with us um, yesterday, we have a lot of um, a, a lot of concern about where we need to go with law enforcement, and the concerns are legitimate. And we need to be very careful that we do things that are um, the right thing to do, without um, overreacting or underreacting. We need to be. Very, I I think that there is the possibility here of us doing things because they might sound good and in the end they're more harmful than helpful. So um, we've kind of divided this up between judiciary and um, government operations and Aton was and the commissioner were both and Julio also in judiciary this morning and the, and what we've done is on our website there's a list of questions that have come in and there's also a list of categories that came from the commissioner's list. And we're trying to kind of break it down and look at those categories. So um, yesterday we went over where we, what we've done in the past, some of the things that we've done in the past. And today we decided that we would uh, kind of focus on um, improper conduct. And so in today, I think that there might be, was Gil, is there a handout here from me that has uh, that? Uh, there is a handout from you and there is also a document from Betsy Ann. Okay, great. So the, what the handout from me is, it's under, is on our web, our, on our committee webpage for anybody who's looking and it is under my name. And what we did is kind of tried to, so that we're not talking about all issues at all times with everybody. We tried to break it down into categories and this one. And so what I tried to do is put all the uh, things that came from the commissioner that I felt dealt with improper conduct and allegations that concerns co the conduct, allegations, reporting, discipline, release of information, kind of put that all together in here. And then a lot of these other, a lot of the other list is um, things that have come from outside of the, the legislature. They came from, some of them came, like I said, from individuals. Some came from the social equity caucus that's set up by the legislature. Some came from the NAACP. Some came from the community equity uh, committee in Brattleboro. So they've come from different places. And so that's what this, that's what this list is here, kind of about the topics to be dis, uh, discussed today. And then Tuesday, I thought we would start with um, looking at training, hiring, promotion, um, the, that whole kind of those, those issues. And does that make sense committee, instead of trying to just do them all together? Yes. Yes, very much so. Okay. They're, all they're right. overwhelming all together. I think if we take them subject by subject, it's the only way we're going to be able to tackle them. Right. So um, I guess what makes sense for us right now is to kind of look at a, a current 
review the current practices, where we are with um, how we deal, what, what is improper conduct, how we deal with it. And most of this is um, stuff that would have come from um, the redo of, I don't even, it's not 124 anymore, but whatever it was a long time ago when we changed the certification processes and then changed the, um, how, to, how to do discipline and who, did dis, who does discipline and stuff. So is that fair? Is that where you think we should start committee? So we can see where we are right now? A absolutely. Yes. Okay. Is Anthony with, oh no, Anthony cannot Anthony be with us. That's right. not able to be yeah. here. He right, right. And Chris is here. Yeah, I see him. So Betsy Ann, would you like to um, just kind of give us a, an outline of where, where we are? And, and I think that we're going to have some comments, I'm sure, from, from people in the media. I know Aton has some comments. I'm sure that law enforcement people have comments. So we'll go to that afterwards, but let's see where we are now, okay? Sounds good, hello. For the record, Betsy Ann Rass, Legislative Council. Um, for today's discussion, I did just put together a short outline that Gail posted for you on the Senate GovOps webpage. Thank you, Gail. Um, this handout overviews the current provisions in regard to disciplining a law enforcement officer for unprofessional conduct by the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. So what this document reviews is what the state uh, professional regulatory authority is. Um, it does not address what an individual agency might do to discipline an officer. Um, but it starts out by just reviewing where the state came from prior to 2017 Act Number 56, um, because that was the act that um, revised the state's professional regulation of law enforcement officers. Um, I just noted at the top of this document that prior to Act 56, um, and those provisions came into effect on July 1, 2018. But prior to that, um, the Criminal Justice Training Council only had the authority to decertify a law enforcement officer. And it was decertification or nothing. And decertification was only possible if an officer was convicted of a felony or did not comply with annual in-service training requirements. And there was a waiver authority in there to uh, um, be able to give an officer more time to complete those annual and service training requirements. So it was decertification or nothing. And decertification was only possible if the officer was convicted of a felony or didn't comply with in-service training. Those were the only bases for the state to take action against a law enforcement officer's certification. So the General Assembly enacted um, Act Number 56 in 2017 and it added what is now subchapter two of the council's chapter in regard to law enforcement officers. This is an unprofessional conduct chapter. And I've just tried to summarize its main provisions. Uh, overall, this new subchapter defines what constitutes law enforcement officer unprofessional conduct from the state level. It requires the officer's agency to investigate allegations of an officer's unprofessional conduct and report findings to the council. And then it permits the council to impose a range of sanctions on the officer's certification. Uh, just a note that right now the council is constituted as a 12 member board of appointees, but uh, this committee proposes changes to the makeup of the council in S124, which is yet to hit the floor. So just to get a little deeper into the details of what this unprofessional conduct subchapter does, um, in regard to unprofessional conduct, it separates it into three different categories, category A, B, and C. Category A is in regard to crimes, and it's defined as any felony, a misdemeanor that is committed on duty and does not involve the legitimate performance of duty, and then there's also a specified list of misdemeanors if they're committed off duty. And it includes things such as domestic assault, DUI second offense, distributing a regulated substance and possessing one uh, second offense. Category B 
is generally gross professional misconduct. Specifically, it's defined as gross professional misconduct amounting to actions on duty or under color of authority or both that involve the willful failure to comply with a state required policy or a substantial deviation from professional conduct as defined by the agency's policy or if it's not defined by an agency policy, then defined by council policy. And there's a list of examples that are included under category B. Um, and this list includes uh, misuse of official position for personal or economic gain, excessive use of force second offense, and biased enforcement. And I just had some footnotes that, again, your S-124 would change this a little bit um, to provide that the list that follows category B shall include that list. Right now it's kind of worded as such as, which may be read to mean just examples. And then you also propose to change this to excessive use of force first offense rather than second offense. And that has a ripple effect throughout the chapter as to when the council has to report category B conduct, um, when the council can take action on category B conduct, um, and generally the council just being made aware of it. Then finally, category C relates to council processes and it includes things, there's a list of what this includes in the statute, but it includes things such as falsifying council documents and an intentional failure to conduct a valid investigation. Um, by an agency when there's an allegation that the officer committed unprofessional conduct. I'm at the top of page two now in regard to investigations of alleged unprofessional conduct by a law enforcement officer. Again, the chapter puts it on the agency itself to conduct a valid investigation in most cases. Um, if there's an allegation of unprofessional conduct in category A or B. However, um, this requirement for the agency itself to conduct the investigation um, does not apply if it's actually the executive officer who is alleged to have committed unprofessional conduct. The executive officer is the highest ranking law enforcement officer at the agency. Um, in that case, it would be referred to another entity and the council could ask another uh, agency, for example, to investigate the executive officer of an agency. Um, so these complaints could come directly to the law enforcement agency itself, in which case it would have to conduct a valid investigation. Um, or if the council receives a complaint, if a complaint goes directly to the council, the council just refers it to the law enforcement officer's agency, unless again, it's the executive officer. Um, and then the uh, council investigates category C conduct and then there's a definition of what constitutes a valid investigation. It's further defined in the chapter. As part of this duty for agencies to investigate law enforcement officer allegations of unprofessional conduct, um, each agency is required to adopt an effective internal affairs program. Um, this is defined to include the requirement to accept complaints from any source, assigning an investigator to investigate whether an officer violated agency rule or policy or state or federal law. Um, the agency has to have policies uh, regarding a code of conduct and the discipline that it would impose the agency itself. Uh, provisions for fairness and discipline. And then a civilian review board also is a requirement of a, an effective internal affairs program. And an agency has to have an effective internal affairs program um, as one of the elements that constitutes what, what constitutes a valid investigation. Betsy, can I ask a question there? Yes. The, the civilian review for a requirement for that, is that civilian review of the, of the, the um, internal affairs program or is it re civilian review of um, um, investigations? So I can't this, remember. Yes, the civilian review, it's defined in the definitions section um, where there would be a review of officer discipline by civilians. And this is, the, this is provided as a select board or other appointed body. 
um, at least for the conduct required to be reported to the council. Um, so I, th I maybe the council could weigh in more about how this would work in practice, but there has to be some outside entity that is um, looking at the discipline that could be, I think, imposed by the agency and okay. for the conduct that the agency needs to report to the council. Okay, thank you. Then there are reporting requirements. The chapter describes when an agency has to report to the council to let the council know about allegations of unprofessional conduct. Um, as far as category A, the crimes, um, it's generally as if there's a finding of probable cause um, that an officer committed category A or that there were some decisions or findings of fact or a verdict on a category A conduct that the officer committed a crime. For category B, right now, the language says that the agency has to report to the council when the agency receives a complaint, if deemed credible by the executive officer of the agency as a result of a valid investigation that alleged the officer committed category B. So right now, how it works is that by this language, um, the council would not be made aware of category B allegations until after the agency went through the process of conducting a valid an investigation and then the agency to determine that it was a credible complaint. Um, this committee in S-124 proposes to change that just to say that if the agency receives a credible complaint alleging that an officer committed category B, then the agency would have to report that to the council. Um, a credible complaint, as I understand how the council would interpret this and agencies would interpret this, is just like an initial screening out process. Is this a completely off base allegation or is there something to it? The council would be made aware of it up front and then the agency would um, conduct its valid investigation. As I understand, this suggestion came from the council and it was a way for the council to be more aware of these allegations and also to keep track of um, the agency's investigation of it. So the council could check in and on the status of these investigations. Um, or if the agency itself receives or issues a report um, finding that the uh, officer did commit category B conduct that has to be reported or if the agency it's really receives the decision or findings regarding allegations the officer committed category B. I think this would be, for example, in a, a, a labor um, uh, dispute or some sort of outside um, process where there was a, an order that was, um, or findings made by an adjudicating body, for example. That would have to be reported to the council. Agencies also have to report to the council if the agency terminates an officer for category A or B, or if an officer resigns while they're under investigation for unprofessional conduct. So all of those need to be reported to the council. So then you should really hear in practice, uh, hear from the council about how this is working in practice. Um, but as I understand the process, um, there would be an investigative report that the um, agency would put together, submit it to the council, and then it would be up to the either um, a prosecuting attorney to file charges, or maybe the officer would enter into a stipulation and consent agreement um, where their facts were um, agreed to um, that after that, after the council re, uh, reviews uh, the evidence that's presented, this would be a contested case if it actually was not a st stipulated to, there would be a contested case. And then the council would be acting as a quasi-judicial body. Um, and it would make a finding as to whether there was unprofessional conduct. And if the, uh, the council would need to do so in accordance with the Vermont Administrative Procedure Act, and that governs our contested cases, um, including unprofessional conduct cases. And there's also within the APA, there's summary suspension authority 
if an officer certification needs to be summarily suspended prior to a full evidentiary hearing, if there is um, a danger, if there's an imminent threat. Um, but ultimately, after any evidentiary hearing or if an officer uh, stipulates the facts, then the council has a greater range of sanctions, and that's the ability to warn, suspend, or revoke an officer's certification. So suspension or revocation means that the officer can't practice while um, the certification is revoked or suspended. During that time, the officer cannot practice anywhere um, while the certification is suspended or revoked. However, there is a limitation on the council's sanction authority. Um, 20 VSA 2407 provides that the council is prohibited from sanctioning an officer certification for a first offense of category B. Um, the last bit I just provided, just a, a one sentence about um, the accessibility and confidentiality of all of these, um, all these allegations. And this is set forth in 20 VSA 2409 within this subchapter. Um, we could look at this in more in depth, but this is based on the current OPR uh, statute in regard to what becomes public and when. So first, the council needs to maintain a public register of all of the complaints that it receives and how the final disposition of them. Um, but an officer's identifying information is only made public once charges are filed or there's a stipulation filed. And so this is the same for, for example, OPR boards, that there's got to be a maintenance of what is happening with the complaints I mean, how many were there, what was the final disposition of them, but it's only after an officer would be charged that the officer's identifying information would be made public. Um, and then the council likewise has to um, provide in this registry um, any of the documents that are filed after charges are filed. For example, any stips that are stipulations that are uh, entered, um, all of that should be made public. And that's another area. I have not gone yet to the council website to uh, look at what this registry might look at and what the council's actions have been to date um, on any allegations of unprofessional conduct um, made against officers. So that would be something um, that this committee uh, could hear direct testimony from, from the council on about how this process has been going. Since it is new, it's only um, just under two years old now. Um, so that would be interesting testimony for him the council, how this is working in practice. And that's it, I can go into further detail if you'd like, but this is just a high level overview. You're muted, Madam Chair. You're muted, Jeanette. Oh, well, there you are. You're fine. I was I was muted, not from me. Um, so I'm going to ask committee members. And first of all, I see um, Brian's hand, and then Allison. Um, if committee members have any um, questions of um, specific questions on this, not why it's this way or why it isn't this way, but technical questions for Betsy. And then I'm uh, when the uh, committee has no more questions about this particular um, where we are now, then I'm going to ask for um, if there are any questions from others who are here with us today, uh, technical questions about where we are today. Not, not getting into a debate about whether it's good or bad or anything, but where we are. Is that okay, committee? Okay, so Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Betsy, the last piece on that document you uh, put forth, the accessibility and confidentiality, so it requires the council to maintain a public register of all complaints, but the identifying or the officers identifying info is only made public once charges and a stip is filed. Are the, is the agency where it came from identified? But prior to, let me see, let me just confirm before I which in some cases, if there's a very small department yeah. or agency, it would be pretty easy to, well, 
maybe yeah i'll just leave it there sorry i'm double i'm no no no. i no, didn't no. mean to get you off guard either betsy i'm sorry <laughs> i'm multitasking right now um, yeah. So I'm looking at 20 PSA 2409. So before charges are filed, um, it's only, only the only thing that would be in the register is the date and nature of the complaint, but not including the identity of the officer and a summary of the completed investigation. So no, the agency would not be named. Thank you. But then after charges are filed, then yeah. the officer's name would be public and then everything that happened um, publicly with the hearing would become public. Thank you. Thank you. Allison and then Chris. Well, that, that was exactly my question. Uh, Brian and I are on the same wavelength here. So what is the value of this if neither the agency no, nor the, the that That isn't a question for Betsy. These are technical questions about right. where we are now. Okay? Right. So technically, this is supposed to be a public uh, register of all complaints, and yet they aren't identified by, are they identified by category? How are they identified? Because if they're not identified by agency, are they identified by types of complaints? Are you saying before the charges are filed? Well, it, it says the council's required to maintain a public register of all complaints, but the officer's identifying information is only made public once charges or stipulations are filed. In the complaint form, how is it presented? Is it presented by type of complaint, by area by whether what type of agency it is we know now that the agencies specifically are aren't identified but what i i guess i don't understand what is public about i mean other are they just listed uh by date uh, you know how so it's the date and nature of the complaint i think the nature would go to a general summary of what the complaint was um so the idea is if there weren't charges filed, then there was not, there's not a reasonable basis to uh, publicize the officer's name because it didn't rise to the level of charges or stipulation. And so right. in fairness, that would not be fair to an officer, for example, who's wrongly, obviously wrongly accused of unprofessional conduct if charges were not filed, or that's the way it should work. Right. And we can hear more from the count, the council itself about exactly how this is maintained and um, right. I believe that this is very similar again to the way uh, OPR does their um, in their complaints against um, professionals so right. we're trying to maintain as much um, uniformity as possible here Chris you had a question uh, yeah same Con, the same area, actually. Um, so when we use the term agency, that refers to, it could be a police department, sheriff's department, Vermont, VSP, any, any, any level of organization throughout the state, correct? Correct. The employer of a law enforcement officer. Yep. Okay. And then, um, so on the same section where the initial, what information is shown if uh, there are no charges filed, for instance, the summary of the completed investigation is also listed. Is there, is there a, uh, are there any uh, timing constraints on how quickly a, f a complaint that is filed must get to, you know, uh, the completed investigation stage? No, there are not. Okay, thank you. Are there any other technical questions here for Betsy on this portion? If not, I'm going to ask if there are uh, people who are with us. And I know we have Mike, Aton, Vince, Susanna, Mark, uh, Julio, Drew, Charity. I don't know if other people have joined us since then questions of a technical nature about this. We're not going to debate, should there be a deadline, um, what should be on the um, website or anything else. But if there are questions out there of a technical nature, a clarifying nature is what um, I would ask. If, and I, if I, can, I can't see everybody. So if I don't see your hand, just holler. I see Mike's hand. Um, so Mike, 
Thank you. Uh, just two quick questions. When it says the nature of the complaint, does it, is it broken down more than just unprofessional conduct or does it say police brutality or potential fe uh, thievery, embezzlement, something like that? I mean, I guess that's what I'm trying to understand. Do they leave it vague, the nature of the complaint? I'm not sure what that means. Madam Chair, may I answer that? Yes, please. I'm, uh, yeah, my apologies, I'm in and out. I happen to be the only one working, so I'm uh, oh. in and out of the office. So, I, so I, just I, identify I, yourself, Drew, so that um, we know who you are. Right, uh, Christopher Raquel Brandon. Oh, it's Chris. Department. Okay and from the Criminal Justice Training Council. So I heard a portion of the question and the portion that I heard was about um, how those reports are calculated and, and how they're displayed. And typically when those reports of unprofessional conduct are accepted from the council, there are two categories of reports that are made public and affected. One is the category of reports received but do not rise to the level of professional misconduct. And then the second category is reports that um, the council takes action on. So the, the last question that I just heard about what type of information gets put on the council's website about the, those that do not rise to that level are essentially the complaint that the uh, date was received, the nature of the complaint, um, the summary of that, and then the substantiated officer, um, if, there's a, if there's an additional summary. So for instance, one in November of 18, the nature is a possible category B violation in, in the agency policy violation. Summary listed as investigation conducted, first offense of category B and an agency violation and was substantiated and the officer resigned case closed. Um, so that's an example of information posted on something that did not get to the level of the council. And then ones that uh, where the council does take action, there are other um, essential bullet points that are put out there that it will give the, the name of the um, officer, or excuse me, the date and the nature of the complaint, but not the officer's identity. Um, and then the summary of the completed investigation, uh, the name and the business address of the law enforcement officer, the formal charges providing that they have been served or a reasonable effort to have been served and been made, the findings and conclusions and the order of the council, um, any exhibits admitted at a hearing, the transcript if made, any stipulations filed with the council, and if applicable, any final disposition by the BSC. So those are the types of information on which the council does take action on and, and how it's listed. I don't have the direct knowledge of um, when exactly that is posted to their website. That's typically has been a, an issue done by the executive director and I don't have that firsthand knowledge. Thank you. Mike, does that answer your question? Uh, not, not totally. I, I guess I'm still not sure what nature of the complaint uh, really means. And uh, the other thing is, uh, I guess I'm wondering, I know like when lawyers are under investigation and they decide to turn in their license, they still disbar them. In these cases, it looks like the officer is allowed to resign, but do they still decertify him before follow through on that rather than have him go to another police department after? <laughs> um, I think that gets into more of a substantive question. Than, okay. Okay. So we'll I'd like back. to leave that. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Did, and, and the other question is, uh, can the council, do you know, can they confirm or deny that there's an investigation going on? such as if there was police misconduct in this video uh, of police brutality or something like that. I guess I'm wondering, you know, I, we always laugh when people say I can either confirm or deny we're investigating it, but obviously they are. And the council cannot acknowledge whether or not a complaint has been made or isn't being investigated. Okay, thank you. Anybody else, out, Chris, Ray? Yeah, I just, I'm, I'm still on 2409. I'm looking at when charges are actually brought and there's a, a fuller description that gets shared. Um, it says, for instance, transcript, finding conclusions, et cetera. I, I'm just wondering if that 
in, if uh, Chief Brickell, that might include um, uh, video. Does that become part of the record? That that could include video if that if that video was included in the investigation. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. So does anybody else out there have any clarification questions on where we are now? And since I can't see everybody, I'll listen for a minute to see if anybody um, pipes up. Hi, Jeanette, this is Vince, can you hear me? Yes, I can, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you for letting us ask a few questions. I guess my question is, as I listen to all this, uh, it's the back, I'd like to know what it's the backdrop to. Are you planning to make any changes in any of uh, in, in any of these professional regulation sections, or are you simply bringing everybody up to speed on it for for some other reason? Um, um, I don't know. Maybe I was unclear when we started that what we're what we want to do is we are looking at where we are right now. And where we are right now is actually even a little bit um, farther along than what this says, because we've made a couple changes in S-124. All we're doing right now is looking at where we are right now. Then we're going to start hearing testimony and looking at um, anything around these issues about um, improper conduct, um, tr the discipline process, the sanctions process. Um, I, don't, I think at this point, we are not looking at making changes to the, to the, um, to what is, well, we, we, could, we could take some testimony on what is improper conduct. We are going to look starting on Tuesday at training and the whole training council and what's involved there. I know this is very confusing, but if we start taking testimony just on the whole ball of wax, we won't get anywhere. So what we're doing right now is just looking at where we are. If there are technical okay. clarification questions for Betsy, and then, and then what we'll do is I'm gonna open it up to people to start making comments kind of on where we are and where we might think about going around these issues. Okay, very good. Thanks for clarifying that. Sure, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so then what I think we'll do is start just, and I realize it's kind of hard to uh, confine your comments to this, but I, I think that any comments that are around what should be improper, conduct, what, um, how should we deal with it? Is this the way we should deal with it? How is the um, citizen review the correct one? How do we deal with local law enforcement agencies around how they um, release information and how they um, do citizen review? So I think kind of that, whole, this whole ball of wax, there, there are too many balls out there. And I must admit that it's getting very confusing. But does that make sense, committee, to just start hearing some testimony now? And I think because of where we are right now, the way we'll do this is um, more like we do when we're in regular committee, is just kind of hear from different people. And then when we have heard from any, anybody who wants to speak on all of this, is then kind of open it up for the general kinds of discussion that we've been having in our committee um, when we meet this way. Does that work, Brian? Works for me. Allison? Chris? Okay, great. So I'm going to um, go just in the order that I had it, took it off the participant list here and start with Mike Donahue. I'm trying, to unmute. Yeah, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to yeah. unmute my mic. No, I'm trying to unmute my I know. People have been trying to mute you for years, Mike. <laughs> You've mastered it. <You're... laughs> <laughs> Looks like he's got a halo behind his head, doesn't he? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, don't even go there. Yeah. 
uh, Madam Chair, uh, I just as soon defer to hear others. Um, uh, there's going to be some comments. We'd rather I'd, I'd rather let the police and others take the lead. I mean, obviously, we want to talk about transparency and things like that, mm -hmm. and okay. it will all dovetail together. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. So next on my list, if I can find where I wrote it down, I believe I had Eitan. Dr. NL. I'm here, I'm here. Okay, so do you, I don't, I think you have been before our committee before. I have. Okay, great. Okay, so no need to reintroduce yourself, just take it away. I, I get you're being very structured and principled in how we're approaching this. And I guess I'm just a little confused. Where are we right now? What kind of commentary are you taking? Right now, you can comment on anything that is in this document or that deals with improper um, conduct, unprofessional conduct. Should we expand it? Are there other things that should be included? How do we deal with it? Is is the way we deal with um, discipline the appropriate way we should be dealing with discipline, uh, community review panels, whatever? I, I'll keep it fairly short because not all of this has been firmly discussed yet in the RDAP, but one thing that came up overwhelmingly when we put our report together in December was the need for community involvement that there really, really intensely needed to be a rather dramatic expansion of community involvement in this process. Um, it needed concomitantly to be far more transparent than it is and comprehensible. I listened very avidly to Betsy Ann's description of the, of the <laughs> and I've read it several times, certainly. And, you know, I'm someone who reads Kant and Hegel in the original without getting too lost. I was lost. Um, this, it's a bit labyrinthine. I understand the reasons why it is. But I would say that I think what becomes important here is some balancing that is better than what we presently have that certainly takes care of the law enforcement officer, but makes this system more accountable and more transparent to the people who are served by law enforcement. Right now, I don't feel like that works particularly well. So my question to you is, how do we do that? What are some suggestions that you would have for how, how, how we do that? Because, um, we want to be responsive. Right. The, fir the, the first thing I would, I would, I always keep going back to this, this report we all spent several, like eight of our nine lives on. But one of the big things, again, that we handled when we wrote this had to do with those panels, that there need to be more citizen advisory panels. A, a member of our panel actually is not, doesn't feel that goes far enough. She believes that advisory panels have no teeth. So I would say there's a bit of a tension on the panel, as you can imagine, between advising and actually having some more power to affect matters in real time, in real space, in real life, not simply being conceptual. Um, that, again, that's attention on the panel, um, but I certainly think we need to start looking at more of that involvement um, from the community, from the people, as I said, who law enforcement, um, works with, works for. Uh, there, needs, there needs to be more of an interaction there than presently exists. Chris? 
Um, Mr. Nusrat, long ago, just referred to a report. I just want to make sure I understand what report you're referring to, please. This is the report of the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel. Okay. It Thank was you. submitted to the legislature on the 4th of December of last year. Great. Thank you. It's on our website. Right. I just want to make sure I'm on the right report. Thank you. I yeah, sent it in just before the meeting as well. Thank there you. There are that a was... lot of reports. I'm sure there are billions. <laughs> Allison, did you have a question? Oh, I guess not. Um, so I, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm not sure the um, the action steps or the or the practical implication of what that means in terms I'm, I'm, of. Mm -hmm. it, 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 we should have more panels. What does that mean? More panels around what and what do those, we've already been told that we have too many boards and panels and commissions. And so what does it mean? I, I was um, hoping perhaps when we get to getting into this a little um, deeper, this morning in judiciary, Julio, um, and I think he's with us, um, he is. At least he was. Okay. Um, the, he had some very interesting comments about the way, uh, I think it was um, Seattle and some other towns were, were looking at this and kind of a, um, what he called a communications loop. Yes. As, as opposed to necessarily having a group of a, a panel, but a communications loop that was very, very effective. And I wondered if maybe we could have him talk to us a little bit at some point about, about that and how that might um, somehow satisfy your, your need to have more yes. community involvement, which we yes. definitely need to, but it's how to do it. Absolutely. And I, I'm fine with that. I would just say um, in, in, Contending with what you had just said about we have we're you know we're all told we have too many panels and too many committees and such. That's I think quite true. I seem to be on a lot of them, but um, mm -hmm. not of the sort I'm talking about. That we don't have a lot of. We don't have a lot of brown person, lesbian person in Bennington, sitting on a fair and impartial committee that directly addresses the Bennington Police Department. That we don't. I know that because as the co-chair of fair and impartial policing for the Vermont State Police, I am continually, I, I mean, I can't even tell you how many times I am approached by people who have had something happen and they say to me, I need you as the co-chair of fair and impartial policing to take this on. And I listen and then I have to stop them and say, no, 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 this is only for the state police. And they said, well, what do I do about X? And then I happen to know X doesn't have anything like this. And the conversation degrades from that point into a place of extraordinary frustration and powerlessness. So I guess what I'm trying to say is you're right, we have a lot of panels and stuff, but you have to then specify panels for whom. And I don't think of, that there are a lot around what I'm talking about. Allison, and then Chris. Uh, Eitan, are you suggesting that each agency should have a, a community uh, oversight panel that, that is made up of members representative of that community? I think what I want to say is I want, I see a spectrum here. We can be where we are now and we can be to something like you're describing, Senator. I think what I'm saying is I don't have the answer, but I want to move on that spectrum closer to the end that you're talking about. So, so may I just add uh, to that, Jeanette? Um, yeah. Etan, each select board or each city council hires 
their agency hires either hires the sheriffs to do the patrols or they hire their police and their department. So yes. in each case, in each agency, there is an employer. Yes. Is generally as, uh, it, it, well, it, let's just take the police departments and not the state police. Mm -hmm. um, those are all citizen panels. Mm -hmm. uh, and I yeah. wonder how we could empower them further. Well, anyway, you know, so we already have a, a panel, as it were, of made up of citizens who maybe aren't fully representative of their communities. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, they're elected. Um, so I just am wondering. I think you know, that's we where we have, have to go. There and, and how do we empower them further or how do we delegate them to, to be more engaged in solving this problem? Again, I don't have all the answers to that, but that's the issue for me is right where you've put it, that we have that. And yet people are who come to me and think I can do something, um, they know that they've tried it and they're still unsatisfied. So it would seem to me that whatever answer we come to, to the questions you raise, take into account we have select boards they are employers but for some reasons this process is not satisfactory the case of that i know of a of a of a gay woman in wilmington um i could talk about three people in rutland um that that somehow still does not work i think some de dedicated and focused scrutiny on that link in the chain is precisely where we'll find the answer to the questions you're raising. So I would suggest that one, oh, Chris, I'm sorry, you had a question. Um, yeah, I was following up on Senator Clarkson's question. So it sounds like in part, there's a question about who's on the panel membership. Correct. Right. And then is it also the nature of the process the panel uses what kind of work they do, who they can ask, what questions, what kind of outcomes they can help deliver. Yes, I hadn't gone there, but it is. Yes, absolutely. And it doesn't seem to be consistent, I have to say. That may be my perception, given the pe people I'm speaking with, but it doesn't seem to be consistent that panel A, whatever we call that, that could be a select board or whatever, does not offer the same remedial moment process that another panel might offer. That lack of consistency drives people nuts. And certain people of color look at this and go, this is why I don't want to go somewhere. So I, Oh, Chris, follow yeah. Up? yeah, just yeah. so it is part of the, uh, I don't know, sensation of such an unsatisfying experience that someone does not feel heard. Correct. Absolutely. They not only don't feel heard, it doesn't, it, it, the condition of possibility of being heard does not exist. Thank you. You're welcome. So I, I would, um, was thinking of a couple things here when we were doing this is that um, we could uh, ask uh, VLCT to give us some information about what kinds of different um, community panels there are out there and how they're constituted and kind of what, I, I don't think there will ever be absolute consistency from town to town um, as long as we have elected select words. Sure. But, we, but we could get a, a kind of a rundown of what kinds of community panels there are out there if it, if it is the select board or if they have a, a community review panel or what they have and what their authorities are. Yes. And um, so we, we, we could, um, I think, look at that and then, and then begin maybe to bring some consistency. We, we have a very, as you know, a very weird um, issue of 
judicial consistency and law enforcement consistency in this state because we have 14 different elected state's attorneys and they all operate differently. And so some in one county where something would be a crime, in another county, it's just dismissed. So we, we will never achieve absolute consistency, but I think we can work toward it and at least set some standards. Yeah, and let me, you know, I'm certainly not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV, nothing. However, I certainly note what people in the community, in, in communities of color, uh, communities of people who are perhaps neurodivergent, um, say to me about that lack of consistency it often feels that the law is set up in such a way as to minimize complaints from disadvantaged communities. And the answer is often given to us, well, we can't do anything that's the law, as, and that's an end term. It's as, it's as real as looking at Campbell's hump and going, well, it's just there. There's not much to do about it, it's there. It's extraordinarily frustrating and it, it makes a second class tier of citizenry. It historically has done that in the nation and it certainly has done that here as well. And that's why I think this is, it's really critical to talk some more about, I love what you were saying, Senator, um, about how to approach this, to look at the different panels, the different boards and speak with the council about how all of this intersects. I think that's an excellent place to go. Thank you. I think that since we're, um, we kind of got off Clark. on this. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, Eitan? Senator Clarkson has her hand raised. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to underscore something that Mike Sherling said yesterday and, and that his draft recommendations uh, encourage us to to move towards is just precisely what you're saying, Eitan, uniformity yes. of policy on all these issues, so exactly. that it, it you know it is clear just on from our most you know we're not we're partially involved we're not deeply in the in this uh, as people who live and breathe it but we live and breathe in our own way this issue and. Over the years, I have to say uniformity in this is clearly calling out to us to establish uniform policy. And, it, you know, because it becomes frustrating. I mean, there are what? There are roughly 678,000 people in the city of Boston, 627,000 people in the state of Vermont. We can't pull this together. I mean, it would be like somebody saying, I walked into Jamaica Plain and this happened to me but it was a completely different experience at Downtown Crossing. That's absurd. <laughs> well, I That's do think- absurd. I do think that comparing the state of Vermont to Boston is not just because population, let me, we have 246 towns in Vermont. It is not, we are not one uniform um, town like Boston. Boston controls Boston. If you went from Boston to Worcester, you might have a different experience. And Absolutely. that's that's what we're talking about here. Not 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 the fact that we have a population that's similar to Boston. I would counter, however, that people don't look at things like that when they're actually sitting in a control car. And I would say that when they're being, I don't know, pulled over. And there's a question about why they're being pulled over. That sort of consistency ought to exist in a state this size. I, I agree we need to have some consistency, but I, I am not, I am a little bit reluctant to tell every town that they're going to have to have a review panel and it's going to have to be, it's going to have to function in this exact way. I, okay. I think we need to have consistency, but we'll take more more about that. And Eitan, you and I can continue this conversation. Um, Absolutely. At Curtis's or someplace. Sure. Um, <laughs> they're open, by the way. Um, oh, 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 good. <laughs> can't you can't you smell it up there? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Thank he is, you. He just lives a little ways from Curtis's. Um, yes. So I think though that since we've kind of gone into this uh, issue of community involvement and uh, how to get communities and stuff involved, I would like to have um, Julio, if you're willing to talk a little bit about how, and I realize this is a little bit off the topic, but I think it's important and we've gone there. And I, I was very intrigued this morning when you were talking about that. Sure thing, just introduce myself to some of the committee members before whom I haven't uh, spoken before. I'm Julio Thompson, an assistant attorney general and director of the attorney general's civil rights unit. Uh, so what I was, uh, I was talking about this morning really had to do with, with a process that it's a pretty long, I mean, it's, it's a process of reviewing uh, use of force incidents, not complaints really, but, but use of force incidents that um, I was giving the example of a type of review that was really inspired by questions from communities um, in the early 2000s and, and to some extent, and even in the mid 1990s here or there, but what, which I saw institutionalized in Seattle, where if there is the department will review uh, uses of force before a use of force review board, um, which is, you know, has a, a variety of different members, but includes training members so that the training staff is there to provide input on whether the officer's behavior is consistent with what the department trains, uh, to identify or speak out if there are equipment or communications or research needs that may have uh, assisted the officer or you know, generated a better result. Um, but also to take lessons learned from a real life use of force situation and reincorporate that into the curriculum for not only the basic patrol training for new officers, but for continuing uh, training in issues like de-escalation, could be vehicles, it could be uh, self-defense skills and so forth. Um, so that's a model that it, it's not unique to Seattle, but it was one that, that's that been fairly robustly institutionalized. There are lots of departments now that do something very similar. It's a critical function. You know, um, I remember um, talking with, um, a, tra a training official in Seattle, this must have been in 2013, who also was a, um, a high school uh, coach. And uh, she pointed out that um, even when their team wins, they still go over the game film uh, to see whether they could do things better. And it seemed a little surprising to her that police departments didn't institutionalize that practice. The military certainly does in after action reviews, uh, increasingly as, as Departments try to raise their level of professionalism and consistency. When you institutionalize that feedback loop, the idea is to try um, to learn lessons. And so when an officer does something uh, that's particularly exemplary, that might be highlighted in, in roll call briefings as well as continuing training. Um, they will also routinely, if an officer is in a significant use of force incident, send that officer for a separate briefing with training. It's not punitive. And it's to go back and talk to the officer about maybe technical skills or you know, either for refresher training or for them to debrief and get information from him that they can use in a training. That could be things like how the officer handles their flashlight, how they use the radio, uh, you know, what their um, what their hand skills are, their vehicle skills, and so forth. So that's really what I was talking about earlier today. It's a little separate than civilian review. And I, and I do have a couple of thoughts to add on that if, if the committee's ready to hear that, if they have questions. Yeah, thank you. I was thinking that um, when you said that, you did say that a lot of comments came from community members that fed into, right. this, into this loop that was, and then the loop becomes the training loop and the um, action loop. But um, yeah, okay, thank you. I'm now, sorry, would you? Would you, Go are ahead. you moving to someone else or would you like to? No, no, I, you, you had said you had something else you were gonna. Yeah, so on different models of civilian oversight. So, um, and I know Commissioner Sherling's familiar with the organization because I think he spoke, I think I saw him, although we did not meet at last September's conference of the National Association of Civilian Oversight and Law Enforcement. Uh, it's a longstanding organization that basically is a professional organization for people across the country uh, who engage in various forms of civilian oversight. 
It provides training, it provides technical assistance, uh, and it provides a network for professionals who work under different models to communicate with each other about best practices, about how to improve or modify their practices. I might add, there's a, there's a Canadian a counterpart called the Canadian Association of Civilian Oversight and Law Enforcement. There are different models. Um, and I, I think we heard some question about whether there's a one size fits all. Uh, a, a kind of a key principle that NACOL teaches is that it has to be very community driven, that different communities have police forces, different sizes, they have different priorities, um, and they have different needs. One model is what's sometimes called an ombudsman or a monitor, or even an auditor model, where they periodically review policies or also review complaints and investigations, and then publicly report on whether the department is actually following the policies that they've adopted. Is their training consistent with them? That's the auditor model. Another model that's an investigative model where the, the, the city or the town uh, or county may have paid investigators who investigate cases, either in lieu of the traditional internal affairs unit or in parallel. Um, I, to use Seattle for an example, they have an, a civilian-led agency called the Office of Professional Accountability. Uh, DC has the um, Office of Police Complaints, and they have paid investigators who, when they receive complaints of excessive force, bias policing, or harassment of the like, they have uh, investigators who can go out, interview witnesses, and so forth. Um, now, uh, some cities have overlapping models, like uh, there's also police commissions where they uh, address policy, if there are policy changes that need to be. If, there, if, if for example, a department um, is thinking about getting a canine in a, in a municipality, the uh, civilian, the, the, the police commission or the equivalent would have a key role in laying out for the city what the answer the policy would be, or if there's a statewide authority, uh, you know, interfacing with the statewide authority about what those policies would be. Model. Um, can I, can I, hearing and Julio, can I interrupt yes. just, Julio, can I interrupt just a moment? I think sure. somebody is typing away and I can hear their um, uh, keyboard, but I'm not entirely sure if that's what it is or if it's just some little uh, ticky, ticky, ticky sound someplace. But OK. Uh, so another model is um, that, uh, you know, again, in some, uh, it, in some parts of the country, it's gaining currency or inspector general units. So you might like Seattle has a new inspector general office. So they, um, they not only look at what the police department is doing, they're also looking at how well the civilian authority is investigating cases uh, fairly and holding officers accountable. Uh, you know, when appropriate. Uh, there is, I should add as a caveat that history has shown that the mere establishment of any one of these uh, agencies doesn't guarantee success. Uh, famously in 2017, the Department of Justice issued a very scathing report of the Chicago Police Department that severely criticized the, an independent investigative agency known as the uh, Independent Police Review Authority or IPRA. Um, they're trying to rebuild IPRA from the ground up. Um, so it's not just creating these structures. There has to be uh, mechanisms to, to ensure that, that the those who investigate uh, the officers are themselves held accountable. Um, the, the larger, and there are other variations of these models, such as if there are discipline review boards, some jurisdictions have civilian representatives who are part of the, those review boards and have a voice um, and a vote uh, in, you know, in various jurisdictions. There are many different sorts. Uh, and a lot of them are basically the ones that work more or less successfully. And I don't know that any are perfect, but are ones that are built from the community up uh, rather than something that's just taken off the shelf um, from, you know, from some other state. Uh, and part of NACOL is to try to help communities tailor what they need for their police department. Uh, so here, and all of them have police certification and that definitely is a source of uniformity uh, in states. It's not that different. Yeah, I think the, the, the reference to OPR um, was quite similar. 
And although, uh, uh, to get back to the point about community diversity, in terms of, you know, the folks who talk, I think, um, in, in the area of police professionalism, and I'm, I'm not a law enforcement official, but I certainly um, uh, follow um, discussion and writing in this area. Um, you know, they will point out, uh, I, only yesterday, Ron Davis, the foreign, former um, uh, director of the COPS office under President Obama, noted that, you know, in medicine, if you, if you uh, have appendicitis, how you get treated in one state versus another or a county versus another isn't really that different. Or if you need a root canal, the treatment and standards are really not that different. Uh, whereas policing, and nationally we have, no one really knows, I mean, 16, 18,000 police departments. We have the most decentralized system out there. Um, and I think what you've seen from uh, public safety this week is an effort to get some level of uniformity for standards and training. But the issue about citizen involvement um, is, is, you know, you need really need to hear a lot from different communities because not one model fits all. Any questions for Julio about, about this? I'm sure we're gonna hear from him more about other things also, but about community involvement, we got kind of over there, but um, I think it was a good discussion. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to throw in about community involvement and oversight? Allison? Thanks, Julio. Very, uh, you know, it's just all uh, very interesting and, and, and sort of exciting actually to hear. Um, the uh, office, you know, we, there's been lots of talk about an inspector general. I mean, I've heard lots of talk about an, an inspector general or uh, I like the office idea of the Office of Professional Accountability. Um, where do you see that if we decided to go in that direction? Where do you see an inspector general or the Office of uh, Professional Accountability? Where do you see that residing in state government? Or do you see that actually in a more local way, uh, by county or something? Would that be an additional county thing? Where do you see that uh, manifesting itself in Vermont? Let me unmute. So, I, you know, my experience is that office, offices of inspector generals typically uh, crop up where there's a larger uh, population that is able to fund that position. Yeah. And that has a sufficient number of cases or complaints to keep them busy. Um, I haven't seen, I mean, Vermont has so many very small agencies. The notion of having an inspector general over an agency of four officers. Oh, oh, no, ludicrous. I, I, I agree. Right. Yeah. But if it would have to be statewide, as to go back to Aton's point, you know, it's not dissimilar to the size of Boston. The, uh, it would, anyway, I just am curious where, if, where you see that residing at the state level and, um, is it not in part what the AG's office does? Um, really, it's not. I mean, with the AG's office, to, to, to address that last point, I mean, in terms of reviewing complaint of, let's say, biased policing, under state law right now, we have a statewide authority that has authority over every law enforcement, every state or local law enforcement agency to deal with uh, claims of biased policing, for example. And that's the Human Rights Commission. That's in the public accommodation statute. We do not have the authority. So, and when people complain to our civil rights unit that they were racially profiled, we refer them to the HRC because we, we don't have that authority on, uh, granted to us under the statute. Um, but the question becomes whether there are other models in terms of, um, there, there may be claims of conduct or poor policing that may not have a discriminatory basis, but may not be very upsetting uh, to the committee, or there could be practices and policies or de facto enforcement policies that might not fit so neatly under the discrimination uh, rubric that the Human Rights Commission can't investigate a police department unless they have a complainant who's willing to sign a charge. Uh, and we encounter, as I think everyone in any sort of government enforcement, encounter people all the time who complain about something but aren't willing to take the risks 
either the public exposure, fear of retaliation, and so forth, to put their name on a complaint and go through it. So I think there are some limitations. Um, but I mean, we do, at, at some basic level, we've had the HRC um, has that ability, and they have conducted, uh, I, I don't know the number, Borean could give you the numbers, but they have investigated uh, claims of bias policing, whether that be racial profiling or excessive force, um, and and they all and that ex, that authority extends to the Department of Corrections. So perhaps we have perhaps we have the structure, uh, and we just need to review its authority and fund it uh, in any significant way. Like so, the Rights Commission. Sorry. No, no. I I I think that um, what what you just said, Julio. The Human Rights Commission is um, deals with issues of discrimination and bias. Right. The human, the, so if, if, an, if excessive force is used against me by my local sheriff, that certainly is not an issue of discrimination or bias. That's just Could be. That's right. unprofessional conduct. Uh, unless maybe I, unconstitutional. Yeah, right. but, but I'm just saying that every, what we're looking at here is how to deal with law enforcement, right. not, how, not just around, because I don't want us to get so tied into just dealing with racial incidents that we right. we um, forget that there's a whole lot of other stuff out there that goes on that maybe shouldn't go on. And so I, I'm going to um, bring up an issue here that has been brought up before. And I can, as I'm doing it, I can um, see Mark Anderson and the commissioner, if he's here, and Bill Boniak, and everybody just starting to pull their hair out and scream. But when you talked about the Office of Professional Accountability, we have yeah. an Office of Professional Accountability. It's OPR. That is exactly what they do and what they are. They certify people, they register them or license them, and they, um, keep them in line. They investigate um, unprofessional conduct. They have nothing to do with setting the standards for the for who is licensed or certified. And, and we've talked before about, does it make sense for OPR to actually issue the certifications or licenses or whatever you want to call them for police officers? The, they don't do anything. They don't do the training. They don't set the qualifications. None of that. But they, but they have the responsibility for, as an independent agency, to look at in, unprofessional conduct. They do it for now about sixty professions. Am I right, Betsy? And uh, fifty, fifty professions, and um, so. I, I don't know, but maybe that's an area that we should start to look at because that is not, that would not be um, law enforcement investigating law enforcement. That would be an independent agency, an independent oversight agency that investigates 50 other professions. Um, and we've taught, we've had this conversation before and we chose not to go there but instead to make the kind of step to the training council and, and set up different categories and different um, methods. But maybe, and certainly it isn't, we can't do that now, but maybe at some point that is an issue that we need to, to relook at because that would be your independent, um, yeah, Julio? Well, I would just say, I mean, it's, it's possible. I would say that my knowledge of different civilian oversight models I'm not aware of any that um, leave that issues of misconduct or views of use of force or other type of uh, unprofessional or, or misconduct by officers is left to the state licensing authority. Um, it, it's, it's common that there may be issues of certain severity that may go to uh, the certifying agency, whether you know that's roughly the equivalent of OPR or the Criminal Justice Training Council. And part of that, I think, I mean, I, you know, um, part of the logic for that is that um, uh, those agencies tend to be located not in the community um, where the issues occurred. 
Uh, and they also, there are also complainants. Uh, we experience it, uh, we experience this a little bit in the AG's office where a person's unwilling to make the complaint because it may be an issue that's serious to them, but they don't feel like it's so serious that they wish yeah. to jeopardize someone's license. We, we hear it all the time. Uh, you know, I have a problem with my employer. These, these are problems, but I feel, I, I don't want this, I'm afraid if you investigate, that person's gonna lose their job and I don't wanna wreck their career. I just want it to, fix, it to be fixed. So um, like, if you think about like any municipality, we have the state bar where they're state licensing and there could be a professional conduct, uh, uh, you know, um, discipline and even license suspension, suspension or revocation. But in any given city, let's say Burlington, for example, or Brattleboro, if you had a city attorney who was engaging in misconduct, there's usually uh, a means of investigating that within the city. There's a yeah. I I didn't mean to imply that we should just do all investigations by OPR. I'm just trying to figure out how we do investigations and how we involve non-law enforcement in those investigations. And and I I do I don't want us to get off on this topic right now because it clearly we're not going to have it um, now. But at some we had extensive discussions about it before and about how it might work. And um, but I so let's go back here. And I'm sorry I'm sorry I got us off there. But um, I when you said there was an OPA in some places and Allison asked where that should live. I just wanted to for us to back up here a little bit. So, okay. all right, so. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> I'm gonna ask if there's anybody else who wants to give some general comments on what we've been hearing so far and not just about community engagement, remember, but also about the, um, are there things that are not um, category offen B offenses that should be category B offenses. Judiciary is um, right now about to add, I believe, um, uh, um, knee holds and choke holds. And um, there's one other, one other thing. I don't remember, Mark, do you remember the two things that they're putting in there, adding to unprofessional conduct? Um, unnecessary force and, but anyway, so are there other things that from coming from this group here that maybe should be considered unprofessional conduct or, and how do we deal with that? And um, is this the appropriate um, way we do sanctions? How do we, we just talked about that a little bit, but, um, any, anybody else out there? I'm, I can't see people's hands. So Charity, did you have anything you wanted to jump in on or Susanna or Mike? Oh, Mike Sherling is with us again. Hi, Charity. Hi, Senator. Uh, Julio is speaking for our office. So I'm here listening. And if anyone has a question that I can answer, I'm here, but um, no need for me to speak as well. I'll defer to the others on the, on the line. Okay. Thanks. Um, anybody else out there? Um, Commissioner, Sheriff, Susanna, Drew. Hi, Susanna. Hi, buenas tardes. This is Susanna Davis, uh, Racial Equity Director for the State of Vermont. I don't need to hash through everything that other folks have said. They've said it very, very eloquently, so I won't dwell on that. But I did just want to go through a couple of very quick observations that I had Please. that are either directly related or that touch on what we've been talking about. One of the things that I see in the list of Category B offenses is uh, biased enforcement. And if this has been touched upon already, I apologize. I wasn't here for yesterday's conversation. But one thing that I want us to keep in mind is that we don't just have bias in our state based on protected categories. We also have bias in our state against people from other states. And when it comes to policing, one thing that I find is that traffic enforcement is often uh, heavily weighted when it comes to people driving 
in cars with out of state license plates. So I would add for consideration that we either clarify what bias enforcement means and that we include that in that clarification or that we internally issue some kind of guidance through our training or through whatever other protocols we develop to make sure that it's clear to everybody that state plate bias is included in bias enforcement. Oftentimes on our roadways in this state, uh, race and license plate, skin color and license plate color appear to go hand in hand. So, um, you know, if you wanna cut down on disparate outcomes for one group, it makes sense to intentionally cut down on disparate enforcement against another. Um, I'll just keep rolling along. I, one of the things that we're talking about is how to involve local municipal and county level law enforcement in these reforms. I think that's really, really, really important. This is a huge area of opportunity and the more incongruity there is in policy, the more difficult it is for people to feel like they can trust police at all levels. So I would just urge us to consider the response that we frequently get, which is, well, we're so small. We're a department of you know, four or five. You can count us on one hand. We don't have a data person or we don't have the resources for X kind of activity. And so I would just encourage us to consider as, as, as early as we can, how can we support local and county level law enforcement so that that's one excuse that we don't have to hear, which is, oh, we're too small, we can't, we can't do these positive reforms. The next thing is that it is my belief that all allegations of improper conduct should be sent to the council regardless of what category they fall into, um, whether an investigation happens before hand or after, I think that every allegation should, should get sent over. Uh, it's often the case that people in positions of authority who abuse that authority know just how far they can go before triggering major discipline. And so what you may find is that you have a string of not quite but almost conduct. Um, and when you see that emerge as a pattern, it's, it's very helpful and it, it's the orange flags that we never see before the red flags start happening. So I recommend all allegations of improper conduct be sent over to the council. Um, I do support centralizing reporting mechanisms so that there is no wrong door for Vermonters to be able to uh, report any kind of misconduct. Again, talking about the, I guess, what's akin to the federalism issue, right, is who do I go to? Do I call my select board? Do I call the local police department? What if they're the ones who I'm complaining about? Can I trust them to take the complaint? Do I contact the state police, they don't have authority over this other person, this guy's elected, I mean, it's a mess. And so um, having a unified mechanism so that there is no wrong door is gonna be really, really key to maintain, establishing and maintaining trust um, for the public. And last, I was gonna make a point about inconsistency between different jurisdictions around the state, but I think Dr. Nasruddin Longo and Julio have both spoken to that. I do take Julio's point about there needing to be customization based on the unique characteristics of communities. That is to say, not every community needs a cookie cutter approach because communities are different. And still within that framework or perhaps above that framework, I think that end results should be consistent. Perhaps the way in which we arrive at, at a conclusion can be tailored to the needs of the community, but I think the conclusion should be the same such that if I'm in town of town, <laughs> if I'm in the city of Townsville, Vermont, and I get pulled over, it should not matter what color the uniform is, but at the end of the day, the result should be the same. So those are the few points I wanted to touch on. Thank you again for inviting me. All right, does the committee have any um, questions or comments for Susanna Allison? Wrong place, right. Pressing on the wrong thing, duh. Uh, Susanna, it's good to see you again. And it, again, I would just underscore in, in Mike Scherling's uh, recommendations, uniform policy. It, it, you're right, it shouldn't matter what color your uniform, where you're doing it, there should be consistency in how we address 
improper, you know, a, a whole range of, of conduct, but uh, uh, the uniformity of policy is clearly in, in, in underscored at every level here in this conversation. So thanks. Is that, um, I, I, Susanna, um, oh, there, okay, wait, never mind. Susanna, I, um, can you elaborate just a little bit on, um, first of all, I loved your last comment about how the, the uh, how to get to the conclusion may be a little bit different, but that the conclusion should probably be the same. And we see the same in our state's attorney's world is that we don't often get to the same conclusion in different, in different counties. But um, so would you elaborate just a little bit on um, how you would um, establish some kind of a central mechanism for complaints? Would that be through the ethics commission? Would there be a, uh, are, are you talking about here primarily for law enforcement now? I was, I was speaking primarily about law enforcement, but your question is a great one because it raises the necessity for us to have a similar mechanism for all other branches mm -hmm. and levels of government as well. And, you know, the thing about our state government, just like many other places, it can feel cavernous at times. Mm -hmm. We have an ethics commission, we have an HRC, we have committees in the legislature, we have uh, human resources with a big H, big R, and then we have human resources for every agency. It can be challenging for people to know where and how to direct complaints. I was speaking primarily about law enforcement and perhaps that is a central number. I mean, I'm thinking about the jurisdiction that I'm coming from. We had uh, the CCRB, the, Citizen, the Civilian Complaint Review Board, which, I mean, garnered its share of criticism, but um, you know, it was considered an alternative when folks didn't feel necessarily trusting of the internal affairs protocols. Um, I don't know where it should cleanly reside, and I I could hazard a guess here, but I haven't given it enough, I haven't done enough research about it for it to be appropriate for me to guess here. I would say that because of the nature of law enforcement and policing work, it is necessarily more sensitive and more mm -hmm. urgent and more delicate and requiring a higher level of trust from the public. And that therefore it might cost us, but I think it could be worth having an independent entity designed to collect those kinds of complaints. Again, I haven't given a whole lot of thought mm -hmm. as to how, what, what that would look like. Um, within our current structure, perhaps it requires that we deviate from our current structure. But again, we're talking about trust building and that is something that is gonna take a lot more time and, and a lot more uh, investment. So maybe we could, we, I mean, we, we certainly could, we couldn't set that up now, but we certainly could do something to get us moving in, in that direction. Um, so that we're we're looking at it and trying to figure out what it is, and and um, maybe it's one more of Aton's panels. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Sorry, Aton, no, but um, but but I think that we we could get ourselves moving in the direction of at least trying to figure out and get the appropriate people kind of convened to try and figure out what this would look like, where it might live, what responsibilities it might have. Is it just a collection point? Then what happens? I, I, think, I think we could do something like that, right, Betsy? And I might just add one more point to this, which is that a lot of times we see people calling for parallel or alternative systems because they lack faith in the existing system. And there is still the possibility that we could just improve the existing system to keep that trust built in. And when it comes to things like complaints against law enforcement, I think one of the biggest issues that we have is transparency. People wanna know the status of a complaint. People wanna know if a complaint has even been, been filed. People, I mean, I'm, I, again, the jurisdiction I'm coming from, we had a huge fight with the mayor of the city because he was hiding behind 50A, which was just repealed by our neighbors to the West. So, you know, people feeling like information is overly guarded makes them think that the state, and I don't mean the state level, but just the government, 
is either conspiring against them or is somehow working to protect its own against the interests of the public. And so fighting that perception for us will mean more transparency. So we don't necessarily have to create new mechanisms for reporting if we're able to adequately um, improve our existing mechanisms. And of course, I, I realize that you could just put all the information out there, but if an employee is wrongly accused, then you've essentially you know, turned that person's life inside out for public scrutiny without it necessarily being warranted. I get that. If somebody were to file a complaint against me, I might say, whoa, hold on with the transparency. I don't know, I'm just kidding. But you know, <laughs> I, I say all that to say that, um, you know, again, we don't always have to create parallel mechanisms. We can just do a really good job at cleaning up our existing ones. And, yes, uh, um, Chris and then Allison. You are muted, Senator Bray. Thank you for that last comment. Um, it reminds me a little, it's not very apt, but of uh, complaining to the parent of a, of the, uh, a child about their child's behavior. The parent is, they're already, you know, they may try to be helpful, but they have a certain allegiance to their child, you know? And um, so it makes me think about uh, resituating the conversation so that you're not in the home of the sort of the place of power, but that it's a more neutral situation. And I don't know where that is. It could be all the same actors, but who's convening it? Who's chairing it? Where is it held? So that people felt like they were uh, um, sort of in a neutral safe space, not filing a complaint with the, the parent of the neighbor's child in their, on their doorstep or something. Correct. And I think that really gets at the point again about community involvement and community oversight and not just soliciting advice or information from the community, but also giving them real agency in directing these delicate processes. Allison, you had a question? No, I, I, I agree with you. I, well, that goes back to your point about local law enforcement agencies and how do we engage local agencies in, in addressing these issues in their own communities. I mean, that we, we have to give them that, but I agree with you completely, particularly in a small state, we don't need to build parallel systems. We have some very good systems that we need to improve and keep improving. And that's what we think in state government we're, we're working on all the time is how can we, and that's what we're doing here is how can we improve what we, you know, a, a system we have and, um, and not build an entirely new one, which we it, it probably can't afford. And plus we wanna improve what we what we have because we have some very good elements to it that, that just need uh, review and improvement. Correct. If I may, I, I hope yeah. you'll indulge me. I'm, I'm reminded of a, something uh, that I think John McWhorter describes as the euphemism treadmill. This is a completely different topic, um, but in language, you know, where you have a term and it takes on a negative connotation. And so we make a new term, but then that takes on the same connotation. And I think that we're, at, we're kind of at risk of this now, right? It's kind of like um, in, in many years ago in, in our country, we had organizations with titles like Association for the Crippled, right? And then society realized, ooh, ouch, that's not how we should say that. And then we'd say, you know, for the disabled, and then we say differently abled or handicapped. And, and the way that new terms take on the same painful tinge that their previous versions had, um, you know, when we talk about reforming existing systems or even creating new systems, I think that we, we are always at risk of creating systems that are made by the same people. We are the same people and the same, system, the same government and we're creating new things and how do we avoid them taking on the same tinge that the systems they're replacing once had. That requires extremely consistent and deliberate and conscious effort to do things differently than how we used to do them. Yeah. Yeah. That was a long way of saying it, but thank you for your indulgence nonetheless. You don't ever have to thank us for our indulgence. It's always great to have you <laughs> with us. I mean, we, um, so 
committee, where are, did any, does anybody else want to uh, chime in on kind of the general thing we've been talking about? And then I think there are some pretty specific things that have come out of this conversation that we can start, um, maybe not so much today, but that we can start um, looking at in terms of uh, where do we go without, as Susanna just pointed out, improving our current system. Uh, but would anybody else like to just kind of jump into the general, <coughs> Mark? Mark? Mark, that's you. Thank you, Madam Chair. My internet fluid's running low today, so I'm gonna go without video for now. Uh, okay. Uh, just wanted to, to say, I really appreciate hearing all the different perspectives in the, over the last uh, two or three hours. Um, it's been extremely valuable for me just as a, a agency executive uh, for my, uh, my department, um, but also from the perspective of this conversation. Uh, the, uh, there's a few things that have been uh, mentioned, which they're all starting to tie together to me uh, really well with my own personal philosophy, but uh, I just wanted to take a moment to, to mention um, to Senator Clarkson's point about uh, broad uh, uniform policy across the state, uh, that really encourages me and really uh, scares me. Uh, I do still have my hair, but uh, the reason uh, that I uh, become fearful uh, when we talk about that is how uh, specific a policy uh, becomes and what control we have. Going back to my very early days in the academy, uh, the Chittenden County way was often taught, even though I'm from Wyndham County and we don't do business the same way. Um, simply two and a half hours across the state. And so talking about uniformity, um, there's, uh, there's concerns when we talk about that. My agency used to do a lot of uh, de-escalation training and then it was mandated that we uh, teach an annual class of use of force training. And so as we had more classes uh, get loaded on uh, to our mandatory courses, we had to start taking away from the classes we felt were important to our, our community. Um, and not to say that, um, that de-escalation uh, through the use of force training uh, was minimized. It's just it was a prescribed course as opposed to things that we were able to look at and identify at a local level. Uh, to talk about, um, I believe it was Julio mentioned uh, that, uh, and I apologize if I'm misappro uh, misaccrediting uh, this, but uh, to talk about um, the successful organizations especially when we look at oversight and to say that the grassroots organizations that built up, the ones that were developed within the community, and then to build on what uh, Zuzana said uh, regarding uh, the local and community, uh, local and county level uh, agencies and how do we make uniformity. Um, I, these are all just really powerful things uh, that I'm hearing uh, and how do we bring that together. Um, the, uh, my agency, just in response to, uh, forgive me, I don't have the statute in front of me, but the uh, requirement for the uh, internal affairs policy, we've actually been working on deploying an online portal for people to make complaints, not only for us uh, to simplify our operations, but also to, to increase uh, uh, access to doing that. And as I'm listening to conversations surrounding the council, and I'm speaking as just, just an individual uh, from the law enforcement community right now, uh, but to think that we could offer on the council's website a, uh, a mechanism that could provide access for anybody to make a complaint, the council becomes aware of the complaint by being essentially the, the gate uh, to that. And if nothing else, they can say, okay, we're aware of this complaint, and it is an issue with the South Burlington Police Department. So we're contacting their internal affairs designee. And while this complaint has to do with the Wyndham County Sheriff, and we know that uh, Captain San Matero is the person we need to call uh, to be able to start that. And so the academies from the very beginning uh, in a position to serve as, or the council's in a position to serve as that focal point uh, for the state uh, it's already somewhat there in terms of Act 56 uh, and reporting with the public register. And uh, I guess I'm just a, a fan of data. And uh, I know that you mentioned me as a nerd this morning, Madam <laughs> Chair and Judiciary. Uh, and I, I fully embrace that term because I really do care about the data. Uh, there's another thing I want to note uh, just as a comment um, that uh, Susanna uh, mentioned was about uh, the tie to local plates and um, uh, the disproportionate effects it has on people of color. Uh, 
in a county. Uh, I don't. I, I offer this as a, a perspective, not as a definitive answer, uh, but certainly it's worth looking into. Uh, I live in a county where uh, we have a major interstate that feeds uh, the majority of Vermont, as well as uh, access to some of the largest cities uh, in New England. And so it's not uncommon. I'll use uh, uh, Route 30 in, in West Townsend. Uh, you can go on speedtraps.org and it's listed as one of the speed traps. And it's because it's a, a small half mile long section where it drops quickly from 50 to 30. And all the locals know that you go 30. And if you're not a local, if you're not frequenting the area, it's not necessarily an issue of the license plate, but they're going 65 miles an hour. And there's obvious and clear safety issues in a 30 mile an hour zone about that kind of speed. So um, I, I certainly would like to look into the effects that, that out of state plates and, and what effects those will have on people. Um, uh, because certainly that is not right to have those types of things happening. The, uh, the follow up to that though is uh, the quantitative and the qualitative um, I think needs to be examined. Uh, to determine if there's a correlation uh, versus a cause. The other th uh, thing that I'm, I'm just bouncing around in my head right now, but uh, the conversation uh, that, I, I apologize, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, and I think it's Eton um, that he mentioned <laughs> uh, was uh, about the state, uh, the, uh, I forget the name of the panel, but RDAP, um, who, that's a, a state entity and going back to what Susano was saying uh, regarding um, regarding supporting uh, these organizations the it's really interesting because it all ties into a, a book that I think uh, several members of the committee are familiar with known as the Vermont Papers and while I'm not asking for anybody to agree with it in terms of a political philosophy, it really does talk about democracy, grassroots, and allowing people to come together with the group that they wanna associate with, so to speak. Uh, so to, to create a regionalized council, similar to the, to the same way that the, um, the regional commissions operate, for example, Wyndham Regional Commission covers all of Wyndham County, plus like two or three towns that aren't in Wyndham County because it works for them. To be able to provide that level of regionalization where we could start off with maybe all the towns in, in a county serving as that regional uh, regional council to handle things like these. But let's say that uh, the town of, uh, let's say Wilmington says we are better with Bennington Commission and we want to associate with the Bennington Commission, that would be within the right and allow the communities to develop themselves in a way uh, that helps bring in this perspective, helps take some of the burden off of the RDAP committee trying to support locals and, and county governments and really bring in the community into the conversation for the, the people they serve. So uh, thank you for, for hearing me ramble through that. Um, but just wanted to get that out there. Thank you. Any questions or comments for Mark? And yes, I love that book. Um, anybody else out here who would like to kind of make a general comment right now? Chris, I'm sorry. Well, no, I'm just following up. I always appreciate Sheriff Anderson's remarks. And he said something, so I'm not picking on him in any way, but I just responding to the language. You know, if a complaint goes to a quote unquote an internal affairs division, that goes back a little bit to what we were talking about 10 minutes ago when I was saying like, well, to whom are you, uh, to whom are you speaking and who's looking into it? And are you in somebody else's house? Uh, and as opposed to in like in a neutral, a neutral venue. So I'm just sort of flagging the language as it goes by for something in terms of what, where are you when you get to ask these questions and have them investigated? And I think it's that notion of, um, it makes sense to me that there is a quote unquote internal affairs division, but if that's the venue for processing something, then I think you're an outsider carrying a complaint into a place where you're definitely not in charge and it's not your house. So. Uh, Madam Chair, may I follow up to that? Sure. Uh, so, uh, Senator Bray, I fully, fully agree, and I think that's actually one of the uh, areas that, uh, at least for my agency, we're hearing that uh, 
in our, our current uh, uh, current events. Uh, and we're really taking that as an opportunity to reflect and uh, listen to communities that uh, have underlined and underscored how they have been affected. Uh, so I think we're we're trying to to recognize that um, the at the same time, uh, to the extent of an internal affairs uh, investigation, and uh, I'm not going to go by the categories, but let's, uh, I'm just going to say arbitrarily, if I had somebody complain that one of my deputies is speeding, that's an issue that I, I would want to handle within my organization. I don't think it requires a large scale of, of intervention. Right. If I have a complaint, uh, and I've had a few of these complaints, where somebody contacts me or contacts me on behalf of someone else, a, a person of color, uh, who does not feel comfortable coming into quote unquote our house. Um, and they say, we believe we were stopped because uh, we were the skin color. And it becomes a, okay, is, is that the case? Because obviously we want to intervene if, if we have uh, that type of behavior occurring. We wanna ensure our policies are preventing that. We wanna make sure that our training is uh, not encouraging that type of behavior. So those are all things that we need to look at from an internal perspective. And so when we talk about internal affairs, oftentimes uh, myself as an agency head, what I'm evaluating is not necessarily criminal conduct. It is um, whether it's following our policies, if our policies meet the standard and if the, uh, if the standard is appropriate. The, the follow on to that, my agency, uh, in my career, we had two, at least two criminal cases against uh, now uh, former deputies, the, uh, we want nothing to do with holding that uh, responsibility. Uh, and uh, my predecessor in those cases, uh, he quickly uh, contacted outside agencies and said, we believe that we have had uh, a crime occur. We would like this investigated. We were in fact witnesses to some of these crimes. Uh, so the, the uh, transfer of responsibility uh, for um, those cases was also even transferred outside of our state's attorney to another county. Our state's attorney recused herself. So the, um, there's a need for that internal process, but I also fully respect what you're saying. We have to uh, have a mechanism, which I think the council could be that mechanism to say, we have a, a problem with Mark. Mark isn't uh, handling or going to be responsive to this, whether that's true or not. Um, but we can go to this other person who uh, has Mark has no control over and we can tell them and that can follow a process. So uh, I think that might be a way to, to uh, make our process better uh, without adding uh, duplicative or additional uh, uh, features to our government. Yeah, sure. I mean, thanks for that. You know, I, the, <laughs> I felt comfortable saying this because I knew you wouldn't take it as an accusation or anything. It's just I'm sort of observing the language we use and how we talk about stuff uh, as we kind of put everything on the table. Thanks. Allison. So uh, Mark, I like your idea of a, a portal, a, a centralized portal with the council. I mean, for criminal complaints. I mean, uh, uh, you're right, the speeding complaints, you know, you'd have to differentiate, but uh, I, I think just like we're trying to create a, a one-stop business portal, it, it would be great for the public to be able to have a one-stop place where, where all complaints are filed and they're heard uh, thoughtfully and they're delegated. The follow-up to them is delegated in some capacity that's clear. Uh, I, I like that idea. And go, it also goes to Susanna's uh, suggestion about centralizing things. So I, I think that's a great idea. Eitan, did you have a comment? Or were you just waving your hand? No, I, I did. I just want to point out, sort of piggybacking on all of this, but just to sort of, it's the college professor in me. Mm -hmm. the, the issue I think is going to be the notion of home, in a way. Where are you? Where is your community? What is your community? That becomes a very fraught question for people in so-called protected groups. So whatever that is defined as on the state level, you're really going to have to take a lot of testimony and make a lot of consideration of the point of view of people who are not in those groups 
or who are in those groups because that is immediately seen as an otherness. If you're in government and you're doing this, you are an other because people in those groups are gonna see you rightly or wrongly as, I'll just use a phrase from TV, the man. So it's a really a question, it is a cultural question. Where exactly is home? And understanding that that notion of home and belonging means radically different things, for instance, to Caucasians than it does to people of color. That's all. So I this certainly can't follow up with what Eitan just said, but um, I'm gonna, one of the, we can begin to make changes and we should be making changes. But one of the things that struck me this morning um, in judiciary, um, Curtis Reed was with us and he he made the, the statement. And I think that we will address some of this on Tuesday when we get to talking about the training council and the, just the, the academy and the training council and uh, hiring and leadership and stuff. But he said when he when he moved to um, Brattleboro, and I think he said it was 1978 or 79, that the policy of the Brattleboro was it nine. The policy of the Brattleboro Police Department was to stop and interrogate every person with brown or black skin. That was that was their policy. So that is not the policy anymore. And it has dramatically changed. And, and in, I mean, it's taken many years, but it has dramatically changed. And now there is um, a commitment to really uh, performing law enforcement duties in a fair and impartial way. And when he was asked what, the difference was why, what happened? And he said, leadership. Our police chief in Brattleboro is an amazing person. And there are many around the state that, that have, so it, it, it comes from the leadership. And if you don't have the commitment of the leadership, all the policies that we do and all the uh, mandates that we write aren't gonna make diddly squat unless unless you have the buy-in of the leadership and we have the right people in those leadership positions. So I, I just, I think that we, we need to focus, well, we need to focus on all these other things. We also need to focus on the leadership and how we train people and how we get people into those positions of leadership, whether it's in the state police or the smallest um, uh, town, with a, a police department of two people. So we, we I, I just had to throw that out because I think that, that that is such an important thing for us to remember. So, Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I found it interesting when Susanna brought up the license plates and then Sheriff Anderson sort of, uh, I think made an important distinction if a law enforcement officer is using the different colored license plate as a potential clue for who might be driving or in that vehicle and subsequently uses that as a pretext for uh, a, a traffic stop. That's wrong. That's just not what should be happening. On the other hand, as Sheriff Anderson said, and forgive me, Senator Clarkson, but I'm going to bring up my favorite uh, speed trap. Uh, Rutland County has uh, many skiers that come up to enjoy our uh, skiing facilities at Killington and Pico. And if they go through the towns of Bridge Bridgewater or Woodstock, by now, most of the local people, as Mark mentioned, have gotten pretty well clued in uh, that the town has hired them to, uh, to write speeding tickets. That's why they are out there. And so literally, if it says 25, you better be going 25. But the out-of-staters, regardless of who's driving, uh, are not as aware of that. So <laughs> oftentimes, if I'm on my way 
heading east into Woodstock, and I've gone through Bridgewater, and I, I know he's sitting there, and I see a skiing person, it's obvious with the skis on the roof and all, come flying up the other way. I just kind of go, well, good luck. And then local people will flash their lights to warn the oncoming traffic, and then I guess run the risk of, uh, I know this has happened, I don't know how often it has, Sheriff, but they get pulled over for kind of spoiling the, uh, the ticket process, <laughs> and they get written up for defective equipment because their lights were blinking. So anyway, <laughs> I just thought I'd mention, I do think, I, I'm, I'm making light of it, but I do think it's an important distinction that if it's just because it's an out-of-state plate and the officer is concerned about who might be in the vehicle in terms of people of color, that's wrong. That's uh, Unless they're doing something else that would occasion a traffic stop. But a lot of times it has nothing to do with that. It has more to do with them being unfamiliar with the so-called local uh, idiosyncrasies of, uh, of the traffic. So that's all. So, um, Mike, I think that you wanted to weigh in here. Um, do you want to weigh in? And then I think what we'll try and do is pull all the kind of a lot of these despair thoughts together and put them in a in some notes so that we can we will kind of know where we are so we don't lose these. But Mike, would you like to? Uh, OK, thank you, Senator. Uh, just some just some general comments. And I thought the discussion was really good today. Uh, Number one, the Vermont Press Association, and for the record, I'm Mike Donahue, from Executive Director of the Vermont Press Association, and also uh, serve on the uh, New England First Amendment Coalition. Uh, obviously, we think there's a need for total transparency throughout the whole process. As many of you know, there are two standards currently. Uh, the state police got a special exemption about 40 years ago. Uh, some of you may remember the the half dozen state troopers involved in the stolen uh, router bit affair uh, and one of the troopers uh, subsequently committing suicide on the state house steps uh, about, uh, like I said, 40 years ago. Since that time, all state police discipline is behind closed doors, uh, except in a few rare cases. Um, I'm thinking in my time, I can think of four or five cases in 40 years, but we can talk more about those later. Meanwhile, municipal police, county sheriffs, and even some state agencies, liquor control, DMV, fish and wildlife, follow the Vermont public records law for the most part. But that's not even perfect. As an example, two police officers seized uh, two uh, 30 packs of beer from some minors. Instead of logging the evidence and disposing of it the right way, they took it home and drank it, and uh, they were eventually suspended for three weeks, placed on probation for a year, according to the city. The police chief would not give out the names of the police officers for mishandling of evidence, which is crucial in police work. Obviously, uh, I'm sure other defense attorneys would be interested in knowing if these police officers are mishandling evidence in their cases. So the names supposedly were unavailable unless somebody went over to City Hall and got the payroll records. Um, and there was another case involving uh, police that, you know, normally they make arrests on Saturday night for, for misconduct and uh, the, the police officers did the same thing. And yet, again, the names weren't given out. One of them was eventually charged publicly, but uh, they were all being hidden. We would argue that that information should be public. Uh, and I know that there's a fine line between somebody being accused of something uh, and, and something um, and, and an actual findings. But I, I think we'd like to see that conceivably, maybe they don't wanna say who, who a complaint has been filed against, but do a compromise and say, if you asked for a specific name, if a complaint's been filed against somebody, that you could uh, uh, find out whether that complaint has been filed, especially in a major public event. Um, I noticed today in reading the Bennington Banner, the, uh, a victim has reported, told everybody, uh, told the banner, or I guess the public down in Bennington, 
that they had filed a complaint and turned over all the paperwork to uh, the banner and other people. And uh, the police academy is basically saying, uh, we can't confirm whether we're investigating it or not, but yet there's a whole file that's been turned over. Uh, second point is whatever the, the issue is, speedy resolutions of these cases uh, once the investigation is completed um, is necessary. One of the frustrations we hear is that um, uh, especially small police departments where two, three, four officers are involved in a standoff and there's a shooting that they have to put those officers on leave. And it's months and months that those that the report sits at the AG's office or with the state's attorney. Those small towns have to spend considerable amount of money on overtime to fill shifts. And that's one of the complaints we keep hearing about. And I'm sure the police will address at some point. Uh, number three, a couple on, on the paper, the 10 pointer that uh, Commissioner Sherling issued, um, there are a few weasel words, as we call them, the should and may, um, as you go through this, when you talk about uh, police discipline, I think it needs to be more affirmative that they must and everything like that. Uh, uh, the, the, one of the other points that somebody may get to at some point is when there are bad police officers, state, county, municipal, one of the big complaints we hear is that police administrators are not allowed to fire oftentimes bad cops. And they're told to leave it up to the lawyers and the lawyers end up uh, negotiating a settlement with a re resignation rather than firing somebody. And I'll give you an example, the state police wanted to fire a patrol commander who stole $215,000 from taxpayers uh, several years ago by falsifying timesheets to fatten his pension. They took his gun and badge away one day and they were gonna fire him the next day. And when I talked to the director of the state police that day, he said, uh, it's in the hands of the lawyer. And there was a negotiated resignation rather than firing a guy who, you know, ended up going to jail. But, uh, and, and that may be something with labor laws that you're gonna have to take up further down the line. But I would just mention that as uh, we've heard that that has been a problem, but those are just a couple of points we wanted to make and, and we'll get back as you go along through this whole thing. So I just, um, thank you, Mike. I, I do have, um, and I think that oftentimes we talk about um, splitting hairs and I'm not sure sometimes where we split those hairs and what that actually means. But I am concerned that uh, the names of every single person who has an allegation of filed against them would be made public. I don't think we do that in other professions. And um, I am not sure that I, I, the one that you're talking about, they could, they could have done it under mishandling of evidence. And that certainly is a, a, some kind of a unprofessional conduct, I would think, mishandling evidence. But, ju but just simply making public the names of every officer who has had an allegation brought against them, I, I think sounds a little um, draconian. And we, we know also that people bring um, spurious charges or allegations and, and because for many, many different reasons. And, um, but once an allegation is out there of something, it can have a huge impact on the person's career and life. And um, so I, I am concerned about that. I, I agree with you 100%. Just because somebody files a complaint, it's sort of like a civil lawsuit. Anybody can file any lawsuit that they want. Doesn't have to really be grounded too much. Uh, and, and I agree. I'm just not sure where on the yeah. spectrum that some of those have to be. Obviously, if, if there's a complaint filed and it, it's founded and Criminal Justice Training Council files a charge, 
clearly that ought to be public at that yeah. point. Uh, I think it is. Are there Doesn't a couple of that? cases before that point where obviously there is a public spectacle of some sort? Um, I, it, it's always crazy to me that a prosecutor or the police can't say, yes, we're investigating an incident when when it's been captured you know that like what happened in minneapolis i mean if if somebody ever said are you guys investigating that officer's conduct oh sorry we can't say anything because it's all confidential i mean why not acknowledge yeah. we're we're investigating that officer for putting a knee on the guy's throat i mean yeah i've never quite understood why <laughs> why you can't say yes we're investigating or no, it's been found that there were nothing has happened. We've investigated up to this point. And, you know, until a few years ago, um, Betsy has something she wants to add, but until a few years ago, um, I can remember um, being stunned by this, that if, if there was a, and I think I have this right, if there was a, an investigation and the officer was found to, was, um, acquitted, was found not to have any um, substantiated allegations, the, um, the AG's office anyway, and I believe it was the commissioner and other people could not say, yes, we have investigated and we found there, were, there was no um, substantiated charges. They couldn't even say we found the guy innocent. They couldn't. And I, 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 it wasn't that true until just a few years ago when we changed it. I, I think, well, I, I, I would, the, again, looking at the State Police Advisory Committee, uh, I can tell you that SPAC does have the authority to release information on internals and everything like that. Uh, I can think, again, I'm, I'm thinking of about four or five cases. And in, in each of those, it was a case that received a lot of public attention and uh, I remember the first one when Jim Walton called me one night and said, I'm authorized to release this. And, and I was like stunned because they had never released them before. Yeah. But he said that this woman had made so many allegations in public and it turned out that it was 100% false and there was a full internal investigation and they, the SPAC felt that they had to, in fairness to the police officers, say that they were innocent of what this woman was accusing them of. So, and yeah. those are that, and those are like what the four cases I'm thinking of. Similarly, they were high profile cases that turned out not to be quite true or, or were true and what the outcome was. Well, the, the, for some reason I have the AG in, in my head here as not being able to say anything, but I may be completely wrong. Um, I doubt it, I doubt it, you're never wrong. <laughs> uh, I'm not so sure that most people on this call would agree with you, Mike. Madam um, Chairman, may I make a comment? Yes, please. Uh, this might be reflecting the change that you're referring to a few years ago. I'm just looking at our internal affairs policy, which uh, under the heading of review and disposition by the sheriff, it's where I make a finding uh, based on the internal investigation that we've conducted. And that includes that we'll notify, or I will notify the complainant of the final determination of the complaint. It might not be the details of it. It won't be the, the uh, um, any sort of disciplinary action that results from it. Uh, but we'll say that we sustained it or there wasn't enough information to prove it or uh, through our investigation, we're exonerating the person. So we, uh, we will stand by what the, the disposition is. Uh, and our disposition, ironically, um, it could be different uh, than the academy or the uh, training council's disposition because reporting to the council will re happen regardless um, if it meets the, the criteria for the report. So we might actually exonerate someone under our policy because we had a policy failure and then notify the council who says, no, you violated state law. And that's more of a legal issue, which it's goofy, but it's what it is. So then we would go fi uh, fix our policy. So I just wanted to add that. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have Betsy Ann? 
I just wanted to um, confirm that the council is statutorily prohibited from disclosing information about investigations um, that don't get charged. And that's in that accessibility and confidentiality statute 20 VSA 2409 um, D which is that the council, its hearing officer and council staff shall keep confidential any other information regarding unprofessional conduct complaints, investigations, proceedings, and related records, except the info required or permitted to be released under this section. And when the General Assembly enacted this language, it's nearly verbatim um, to the OPR uh, in, uh, information of the confidentiality and accessibility of OPR, unprofessional conduct, allegations and charges, which is set forth in 3 VSA 131. And the language is exactly the same, except for the council's language refers to specifically law enforcement officers, whereas OPR refers more generally to all their professions. Just so, want to does note that, that. so does that mean if um, a complaint is filed and the council investigates it and um, they don't make any charges that they don't even have the right to say, um, yes, we investigated it and found no charges. That's how I read that, yes, because it provides a, f if there's not charges, it provides that the council can only disclose the date and nature of the complaint, but not the identity of the officer and a summary of the completed investigation. So something like this would be an example similar to like an OPR closing report where um, under OPR's practices, OPR will generally describe a complaint, not provide personally identifying information, and then provide a summary that says, you know, there wasn't enough evidence or uh, to bring charges or that um, it, the evidence that was um, uh, obtained did not rise the level of, of unprofessional conduct, for example. So, so if, if we have if, a, uh, if we have a, so hypothetically, the uh, Middlebury Police Department had a shooting case where I think three of their officers had to be put on a paid administrative leave and everything like that. I don't know if it went to the police academy or would have at the time with the law the way it is. So even though that they may have been exonerated at some point, the police academy couldn't tell them, even though the general public knows they've all been suspended or paid up, put on paid administrative leave, I should say, not suspended. But uh, so, and I guess that's why we say we think that there ought to be at least some provision, much like SPAC, that yes, allows sir. the training council in certain cases, if they think it's warranted, when there's been public, great public attention to a public event, that they be able to say those officers were exonerated. Yes, yeah. uh, you would need to amend the council statute because it, otherwise the council is prohibited. And you did do something similar in campaign finance law. This discussion is reminding me of something that the General Assembly did recently um, to add specifically in language, for example, the AG or state's attorney to disclose the results of an, of an investigation, including the grounds for um, whether or not they wanted, they felt it appropriate to bring an enforcement action. So it would seem similar to the SPAC authority um, uh, that the SPAC is in its discretion able to report to authorities or to the public or both on um, information that it possesses in regards to VSP allegations. Yeah, it seems, so to me that you, to, it seems to me that you don't want to say they should all be reported because if there was a complaint and an investigation, internal investigation, and and there was found nothing to be there. You don't want the whoever it is to come out and say, well, we investigated officer so-and-so for this and we found nothing because then that's out there. But if there was some kind of a major event where every, everybody knows this happened and everybody knows that there's an investigation, even if the council can't say, yes, we're investigating, everybody knows that it's happening. It seems to me that it, it is not only in the public's interest to be able to know what happened there, but also in the interest of um, exonerating the officer because now it just hangs there. It's like when you're charged with something and it's in the newspaper and then 
five days later, there's a little tiny thing in the bottom that says, oh, excuse me, we were wrong. We charged this person with child sexual, sexual abuse, but oh, it was a different name. I, I mean, so it seems to me that it would be important in certain circumstances to be able to, to um, make this public. Mike? Uh, yeah, and, and I, that's I, the point I was trying to get to is there are some cases, we probably all had a complaint filed against us when we were working and you know, not every complaint is worthy of, of they get investigated, but they're found to be unfounded. We're looking at, at the ones that are obvious and everything like that. One of the ones that SPAC did make public was uh, a state trooper pulling over uh, a vehicle and it turned out there were, there were two people that were not documented to be in the country. Um, and there was video that was released and everything like that. And there was questions about how the trooper handled that case. And eventually SPAC uh, not only said they exonerated the trooper, I mean, they, they had the dash cam videos. And although I think the dash cam videos, I have to go back and take a look. I think they were actually released even before it got to SPAC. But, uh, um, but everything was put out on the table in that case because they wanted, uh, and I presume the lawyer for the trooper wanted it out there that he had done nothing wrong, that it was a, a standard routine traffic stop. Well, one of the allegations that has been made against me by a few years ago by the Burlington Free Press was that I was a weasel. And um, there was never- That was not me, of, just for the record. That was not me saying that. There was never <laughs> any kind of a retraction on that. So a lot of people in Burlington still think I'm a weasel. But a wonderful weasel. <laughs> Sorry I, not if, me. That was, if that was a little irreverent, but... Um, no, that's fair game. That's fair game. Um, anything else? Committee here, it's getting um, on toward four o'clock on Friday afternoon. I don't know where you are. It's bright and sunny and hot and horrible here. Um, too hot, but um, so I will send um, Betsy, if you and I can maybe get together and put together some notes for what we heard today and, and, um, and then we can begin to take some specific comments on specific issues here. But then on Tuesday, I think what we'll do is start looking at those issues that fall under training and hiring and promotion that area and the and the justice count the tra <clears throat> training council does is that committee are there other and and you should know that just because there are um questions associated with when i put out the that that list of questions and i have a list of questions that uh, um also relate to training and the training council and stuff Th that's not an exhaustive list. That doesn't mean that that's just what we're going to talk about. That's just to give us some um, some things to start mulling around. Yes, Gail? We had also talked about taking up the Pay Act again on Tuesday. Yes, we should do that very first thing on Tuesday. I don't think it'll take us very long. Um, did we find out at all about, I meant to um, send a note to, to Tim and ask him about this $1,400? Did it I think pass the house? The pay act? Yeah. It's uh, in house appropes right now. And I, I just, I got a note that house appropes is hoping to look at it uh, early next week. Oh. On Tuesday, okay. on Tuesday. Actually Monday. Pardon. Monday. Uh, Allison? Jeanette, I did get a response from Tim, but it was, um, it, it, it was, it was short. I'll, I'll forward it to you. It was just, you know, we're in a financial crisis and why would we do this at this point? So, I mean, it was not, um, I, I didn't, uh, when I got it, I hadn't 
Okay, anyway, I'll respond I, to him. I, I, uh, I'm happy to respond, but I, he, he did just say we're, you know, the reason he didn't address the fact that we hadn't addressed it or that there was, okay. you know, the right. other concerns around seasonal uh, yep. assistance. And uh, so. Okay, uh, if you send that to me, that would be great. Yeah. Anything else? There was one other thing on Tuesday that I was thinking we needed to, oh, we need to, um, have we voted out boards and commissions? No, I, I don't think we have. Um, we have permission to vote it out. So maybe we should just vote that out on Tuesday first thing. Okay. And Brian, are you going to be the champion here? I know you said you were done, but. Sure. Betsy, help me. And they took out the most controversial, we've already dealt with the most controversial, right? The State Board Race of Education. Yeah. No, the Board of Education. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so you don't have to defend that. Okay, anything else, committee? No. Gail. Sorry, I just need clarification yep. on Tuesday. If um, Approps is picking it up, are we going to meet at the same time or wait until after they finish their discussion? Well, that's that's House Appropriations on Monday. And then it'll come to us. And I think we should be prepared to make our recommendations to our, because we're not going to pass out a bill. We're just going to give our uh, information to um, Senate appropriations and they'll put it in the budget. I don't think we're going to try and pass it out as a separate bill. Okay, thank you. So um, th that was, there was only that one lingering question, right? It, it, as far as I know, yeah. Yeah. Betsy Ann, was that right? I believe so. I know that Luke would. I, I think that Luke wants to at least uh, just testify on it. Okay. Right. This committee. Yeah. And, and, and um, it, it, I can also forward that question I asked to Luke. I had only sent it to Mitzi and Tim. Okay. All right. So with, I think that we could probably do both of them within uh, 20 minutes on Tuesday. Am I right? Okay. So let's do them first. And then at like uh, 120, we'll start our, our, our ongoing discussion on law enforcement, justice, uh, equity. Um, what else? Good, good behavior, good actors, get rid of bad actors, the whole thing. Okay. Thank you. With that, do we have more to say? Do we need to do more? We, we do need to do more.